Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us forever and today. And so we pray, Jesus, that we will encounter you in this time. You will open our eyes to see you with clarity, our ears to hear your voice speak to us, and most of all, our hearts and our lives to receive what you have for us this Christmas season. Give us a fresh perspective, a fresh outlook on who you are and what you've done. We pray this in your name. And everyone said... Well, if you want to get to know somebody, if you want a kind of full picture of who they are, it's not enough just to kind of for you to say, well, I kind of know you and I look at you from my perspective. If you really want to know someone, you need, you need a broader perspective. There's many of you that are part of Shoreline Church, and you know me as one of the pastors here. You know me as, as uh, Kevin, married to Sherry. You know some stories about my family because you've heard me preach and talk about it. And you say, well, and it's fair to say, yeah, I know my pastor. I know Kevin. But if you really want to get to know me, you can start doing a little bit of research. You could contact a couple of the other pastors of the church and say, uh, what's it like to work with Kevin? You guys hang, hang out together 40, 50 hours a week. What, what do you do? What's he like? And, and you could learn more about who I am. You could, you could ask some of my friends, people I spend time with outside of a church setting. Friends from when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, they'd have some stories to tell you. You know, you could, you could, ask, you know, you could ask the friends that I have now, you know, what's he, is he the same when he's not at church, that's when he's at the church, and you could ask those questions. If you wanted to get real personal, you could, you could ask one of my three sons <laughs> who have known me their whole life. What's he like at home? You know, and, and, and you'd get another, if you really want to know what I was like, you could ask my wife. <laughs> but she wouldn't tell you a thing. Now, I don't know if she would or wouldn't, but, I, but, but you, you'd get a, another perspective. You could ask, I have two older sisters, Gretchen and Allison. If you ask them, tell me about Kevin, they remember me for all those years before I was a Christian. You say, tell me about Kevin back in those years. You'd get a different perspective than you get from me preaching every Sunday. You could fly to North Carolina and talk to my dad and say, Terry, tell me about what Kevin was like when he was growing up. And the perspective of my dad, my father, he would be able to tell you a very unique perspective. And with all those different outlooks, you'd get to know me better. Well, that's what we've been doing all Christmas season, but with somebody way more important than me or you, with Jesus, God who came among us. We've looked at him from the perspective of Joseph, from the perspective of Mary, from the wise men, from the shepherds. We looked at him from the perspective of the angels, the heavenly messengers. They have a unique perspective on Jesus. But today... We will look at Jesus through the perspective of his Father, his heavenly Father. Jesus exists eternally as part of this Godhead, this Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. What would the eternal Father say about his Son, about Jesus Christ? And we get glimpses of this when we open our Bibles and we see the words of the prophets from Isaiah to in the Gospels, Simeon and Anna, these people who spoke the words of God and explained who this Jesus was. I want you today to imagine what the creator of the world, what God Almighty saw when his son became flesh. What did the father see when Jesus Christ, his only begotten eternal son, took on human flesh and became one of us? About 30 years ago, I read a book the title, of it was, was, uh, the title was God Came Near. And it's all about Christmas, how God came, Emmanuel, God with us. Written by a pastor in Texas. His name is Max Lucado. And he's still a pastor. Some of you may have read some of his books. Some of you may not know who he is, but, but a wonderful pastor and a great writer. And I remember reading these words, kind of the, the, the picture of this moment, and sort of, I think, from the perspective of what God Almighty saw, what was really going on when Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, came, Emmanuel, God with us. And so this is, kind of, this is kind of his picture of what was happening when Jesus came at that moment. So these are words of Max Lucado, but just listen to these and get a picture. I think it's powerful. It says, that particular moment was like none other. For through that segment of time, a spectacular thing occurred. God became a man. While the creatures of earth walked unaware, divinity arrived. Heaven opened herself and placed her most precious one in a human womb. The omnipotent, in one instant, made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. 
He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. He who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus. Holiness sleeping in a womb. The creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows, elbows, two kidneys, a spleen. And he stretched against the walls and floated in the amniotic fluids of his mother. God came near. And he came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one who was first heard by the, his cries were first heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. The hands that first held him were unmanicured, calloused, and dirty. No silk, no ivory, no hype, no party, no hoopla. Were it not for the shepherds, there would have been no reception. Were it not for a group of stargazer, there would have been no gifts. Angels watched as Mary changed God's diaper. Pretty thoughtful words. Painting a picture of who this Jesus is. God came among us. And his father, who so loved the world that he gave and sent his only son, knew what Jesus was doing. He knew what was going on. And so, so we, we just get these, these little pieces of scripture where the prophets are speaking on God's behalf. The prophets are bringing God's word to us. So the first one we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, just these two verses, verses 22 and 23, what's happening is, is Joseph, uh, Mary's husband-to-be, Joseph in a dream sees an angel, and the angel quotes Isaiah the prophet from 740 years earlier. So what you're going to hear right now is an angel in a dream speaking to Joseph and quoting a prophet. There's a lot going on in these two little verses. But he says this, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. It's a fair question to ask, why? Why would God, the eternal son, leave the glory of heaven? with all of its authority and privilege and prerogative? Why would he empty himself and come as one of us, born in a major? Why would he do that? And I think there's a lot of good answers to that question, why? To identify with us, to, to connect with us out of love, to lead us home. He, Jesus knew that to lead us home and back to heaven, it would mean coming and taking our hand and leading us because we weren't going to find our way on our own. In a, sense, in a sense, to say, I'm in this with you, not from a distance, but coming up close. I remember in junior high and high school, I had lots of different coaches. And, and there were certain coaches I liked and certain coaches I didn't really respect as much. The ones I liked were the coaches that would at least occasionally run with us. Not the coach that would just stand around and say, run another lap, run another lap. And you look at me and thought, you can't run half a lap. You wouldn't say that in junior high, but you know, you, it's like you know, these coaches that would tell you what to do, but, but I love the coaches that would say, I'll, I'll do a lap with you. There's, they identify, well, Jesus says, I'll come and walk with you. I'll enter your world. I'll enter history. He, he came to say, I am with you. And I think most of all, Jesus entered human history to say, I love you. You see, we draw near people we love. And the more we love people, the more we want to be around them. This is why grandparents can't leave their grandkids alone. You know, I, I, saw, I saw Pastor Steve, one of our pastors here, our military pastor, um, I got to meet his granddaughter for the first time. She's a little cute little punk in there. And, and I said to Steve after I saw his granddaughter, I said, Steve, do you ever kiss that face? Oh, he says, oh, all the time. He loves that little girl. He's drawn near to her. Couples that love each other kind of sit next to each other. They sit closer. They want to hold hands sometimes. That's just, that's what happens. Uh, imagine, a, imagine a woman who's married talking with her, some of her girlfriends. And one of her girlfriends says, you know, hey, do you like being around your husband? And she's, she says, can't stand it. Last thing, I, I just can't, it just, I do not, do not like being around that guy, but I really love him. Really? No, when you love, you draw near. You come close. And you need to hear this today, this, this Christmas Eve day. 
whether you, whether you know Jesus and love him or whether you're at church because somebody said, you don't get dinner until you come to church or what, I don't know, but, you know, but whatever, you know, if, whether you're here because you want to be or don't want to be, whether you know Jesus or don't know him yet, you need to hear this. The God of heaven loves you. He left the glory of heaven to come near so he could open his arms and say, draw near to me. And if you know him and love him, he loves you. And if you don't yet know him, he still loves you and his arms are open and he's welcoming you. That's the heart of God. He came near because the only way you can show your love is by coming close enough to reveal that love. And so God came close. Emmanuel, God with us. So what unique perspective does God bring through the, through the prophet, through Isaiah the prophet, in these words written 700 years before the angel passed them on to Joseph? Well, here's the simple perspective. The child in the manger is God with us. He is Emmanuel. That little baby born is God Almighty, even if your brain can't comprehend it. And, and when you look at this Jesus, God with us, we all know that most people in life kind of keep everyone else at arm's length. You know, we may have, somebody might go, click, click, I'm your friend. Click, click, I like you. That's different than I'm gonna hang out with you and I'm gonna have a relationship with you. And, and Jesus wanted us to know. He wanted us to know, I understand what you're walking through. Jesus wanted us to know that he's not this remote God who has nothing to do with us. He entered history. He walked through life. If you say, but, but, but does Jesus understand what it's like to live life? Yes, he was born in a manger to a poor couple. He went, he went through life like we do. He understands. If you say, well, does he understand my pain? Does this God who, who you say loves me, does he understand the pain I go through? They, they nailed Jesus to a Roman cross the most brutal public form of execution ever invented by the depravity of the human mind. And Jesus took that punishment. He knows what your pain feels like. He's been through it. You say, does he know my loneliness? Can, can he possibly know what it feels like to be abandoned? And Jesus says, oh, I understand that. See, when Jesus went to the cross, every one of his friends, every one of them, ran for the hills. Everyone deserted him. And when he hung on the cross, taking our sin and our wrongs and our punishment, when he hung on the cross, even the Father, who he was in perfect eternal relationship with, because Jesus was taking our sin and taking our shame and taking our punishment, and God the Father who was holy, 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 at that moment somehow God looked away, stepped away, and Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's like he said, Daddy, where are you? Where are you? At that moment, he was so alone. Does Jesus understand our loneliness? Oh, he understands. He understands what it is to be forsaken. He understands you and me. Does he understand the weight of guilt? The shame of guilt? He does. Not because he bore any guilt of his own. He never sinned. He knows the weight and the shame of guilt because he took my shame and my guilt and my punishment and yours too. And he took it all on himself on the cross. He understands. Does he understand punishment? Yes. Again, not that he did anything wrong, but he took our punishment on himself. Emmanuel, God with us, one of us, walking on this earth, he understands us. He drew near because he loves us. And he offers to us himself. And, and, and that's, that's just the glorious truth of what Christmas is all about. In the midst of the celebrations and the family and the food and the gifts, we can't forget that God came among us. There's a second prophecy that comes up in the Gospels in Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25, we, we hear these words of Simeon. And Simeon, God speaks through Simeon and speaks a word to us. And, and, and Simeon has an interesting story which kind of comes out in the passage. Luke chapter two, beginning in verse 25. Now, now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for, for God's redemption, for God's healing, for God's work. He was really waiting for the Savior to come. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Could you imagine that? 
So through his life, he says, my life won't end till I see the Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. It happened to be right when Mary and Joseph came with Jesus. Not by chance. The Holy Spirit led him there. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents, Mary and Joseph, brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him, he took Jesus in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. What's Simeon saying? He's saying, man, I could die right now, a happy man. I could die in perfect peace. I've seen Jesus. He goes on to say this, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He's talking about the baby he holds in his arms. My eyes have seen your salvation. It's powerful. Which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations. It's for everybody. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, all the people groups of the world, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what, he, at what Simeon said about Jesus. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, to, to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon says there is something about this Jesus that uncovers everything about who we are even to the point where it pierces our heart and soul when we recognize who we really are and our own brokenness and our own frailties and our own sins. And and, and yet Simeon says this Jesus, because he comes as Savior, he shows you what he's saving you from. I remember some years ago, my dad came to visit Sherry and I, and and I mentioned before I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and my dad uh, was open to talk about Jesus, but, but at that point had not committed himself to Jesus, still is open, but hasn't committed himself to follow Jesus. But I remember Sherry had a conversation with him out on the back deck, and afterwards she came and she said to me, you know, it was interesting something your dad said. He said, you know, this idea of this God who knows what I'm doing, who knows what I'm thinking, who's always watching me. My dad said, it just kind of bothers me. It feels kind of intrusive, you know. He knows everything about me. And when Sherry shared that with me, I thought to myself, man, that's one of the things about God that I love. I love the fact that he knows everything about me and he still loves me. That's staggering. That's unthinkable. That the God who is perfect and holy knows everything about you and everything about me and he still says, and I still love you. I I think about it like being married. I've been married now for 35 years. My wife knows a lot about me and she still loves me. Loves me as of right now, right, honey? She still loves. See, um, she, you know, but she, she knows. She knows so much of me, and she has seen me in my moments of my best, and she has seen me at my worst. And she has seen me when I do things well. She's seen me when I just kind of lose it, and she still loves me. Well, God, how many multitudes of times over knows everything about us, and He still left the glory of heaven, Emmanuel, God with us, and came to reveal His love and invite us back to Himself. That's love. That's what Christmas is about. So what unique perspective does God bring through Simeon? A lot of different things, but one of the things I see through Simeon's story is this, that God can bring unity and peace between people through the presence of Jesus. When Simeon holds Jesus in his arms, he says, I am now at peace. My life can end. I'm fine now. I've seen Jesus. Jesus brings peace and wholeness and hope to our lives. And we need to walk in that. We need to live in that peace. We need to bear that peace. I'll tell you, at Christmas time, families get together, we connect with people, we have different gatherings, and probably the next 48 hours, a lot of you will be gathering with groups of people. And those gatherings can be wonderful and beautiful, or those gatherings can get nasty and horrible. I mean, there's some chunks of meat you could throw on the table that would cause, I mean, you, and please don't do it, don't do it. But you know, that, you know there's things you could bring up and say, well, what about that? And it's just going to become a feeding frenzy. Will you be the one, even if that happens, who looks at people and says, I love you. Merry Christmas. That you bring the peace and the love and the grace and the joy of Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't disagree. It doesn't mean we can't have intelligent, thoughtful conversations. But man, Jesus brings peace. Will you, around whatever gathering you're part of, bring the peace of Jesus 
And definitely don't be the instigator of conflict and problems. But walk in the peace of Jesus and live in the peace of Jesus. Then there's, then there's one more little pro- prophetic word that comes through Luke 2, beginning in verse 36. And this is now Anna. One more person has a chance to prophesy and speak to God, to speak for God to us. Verse 36 of Luke chapter 2. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. And we get a little bit of a family history here, or personal history, I should say. She's very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. People tended to get married very young in those days. But she'd been married for seven years. He probably passed away. And, but then it says, and then was a widow until she was 84. Potentially almost six decades. So what's she doing during these six decades? Well, it says... She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, to Mary and Joseph, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child, about Jesus, to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. She spoke of of this Jesus as the one who brings redemption to the people of God, who buys us back, who makes things right. This is the one who brings redemption to the land and the people of God, this Jesus we don't use the word redemption a lot anymore. But, but I have a picture. That when I think about redemption, I think, of, I think of coupon people. You know, people who like to redeem coupons. Whether it's, whether it's uh, you know, on their phone where they see you know, it. And, and when, I, when, I go into, when I go into a grocery store, if I'm buying things and I got in my cart, I'm, this is just me. I'm probably weird. But I'll, I'll like, as I'm going to the aisle, if there's no self-checkouts, I'll like look and study all the aisles and I try to figure out which is the fastest. Then I go in that aisle, but that's not enough for me. Then I'm watching the other aisles to see how I did. So you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, and I'm like, two eyes go faster. I'm like, oh, I should have noticed that person. In the other. But, I, you know, but, but I, I've had this before. Where then you go, but you finally, the person in front of you finally gets, it's their turn, you're next. So you're waiting. And then they do the coupon thing. You know, they bring out their phone. They bring out like an accordion type folder that unzips. And they start going, and, they, and I just go, this is gonna be another half an hour, right? But they're, they're redeeming coupons and they get something for it. Well, Jesus came to be the redemption for us. And the price he paid wasn't a coupon. The price he paid was his life, his blood. He died on the cross to redeem us from our sins, from our wrongs. He came so close, so near, the infinite one becomes so breakable that he was crucified and died and gives himself for us. And says, anyone who receives the gift I've given, you can belong to me. I'll set you free. I'll wash you clean. I'll purchase you back. You belong to me. That's the heart of Jesus. And so, what unique perspective does God bring through Anna? This child is the source of redemption. This Jesus born, she holds him and says, this is the one we've been waiting for. For her five or six decades, this is the one we've been waiting for. So I want to invite you to do something. Whether you're a regular church goer kind of a person and pray and that kind of stuff, or maybe this is all new to you. Will you just quiet your heart for a minute? And I want to invite you to pray. If you're a follower of Jesus, join in prayer. If you're not yet there, would you open your heart to maybe talk to God about this? Because the question I want to finish with is this. What might God ask us? What might the Heavenly Father ask us as he looks at his son who came near and came among us and gave his life for us? So just quiet your heart for a minute and reflect on these questions. I think that God the Father would ask us, do you recognize and embrace the divinity of my son? Do you understand that this Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us? And will you embrace that? I believe that God the Father might ask us this question. Do you walk in his reconciling power and seek unity and peace? I think God would say, if you understand that he is the prince of peace, if you understand that he brings peace, if when you see him you say, now I can live and die in peace, I've seen Jesus. Do you carry that peace to the people around you? Do you bear the peace of Jesus? I think our heavenly father might ask us this. Is my son the light of your life in this dark world? And do you share that light? Do you shine that light? Is Jesus the light of your life? And if he is, celebrate it. And if he's not, you can open your heart and say, Jesus, I want you to enlighten my life. I want to confess my sins and receive your grace. And I want to walk and live in your light. And I think that the Heavenly Father would ask us this question. Is my son your savior? 
Have you opened your arms to receive him as your savior? He is the savior of all who will believe, but we need to believe. And I think the father would say, is my son your savior? Have you embraced Jesus Christ? Oh, Lord Jesus, as we walk in this Christmas season, I pray that we will enjoy the presence and enjoy the food and enjoy the people and enjoy the music and all these good things. But I pray most of all, we will encounter you, Emmanuel, God with us. And we will walk with you in your presence all the days of our life and forevermore.